Thank you, Patrick. Um, it's really a great privilege to be here, and I would like to thank uh, Deborah Adams and uh, Kathy Kibler for putting this uh, excellent program together. Of course, I would like to congratulate Terry. Terry, after so many years, we made it. Um, who can believe it? When I first came here, somebody told me that uh, you're not going to last more than a week. And that was about 14 years ago. So anyway, something to be said about this. Um, it's really a, a great privilege to be again here. Uh, and uh, after the uh, feedback, when I was talking to um, uh, Kathy and Deborah, we thought that uh, we'll try to make this talk um, very practical. And I think this is very important because the way that I think about it is that whatever I have learned from Dr. Coselli for the last 14 years, it's really my job now to be able to uh, teach you what I learned. Uh, because the important point here is that if I'm the patient, I would like from you to be the perfusionist so we can have great results and great outcomes. Uh, so first of all, I would like to congratulate you for the 50th anniversary uh, for the Texas Heart Institute uh, School of Perfusion Technology. Uh, it is really, it is really a, a great uh, milestone and you have to be very proud for it. Uh, this is my disclosures. So the things that we're going to talk about is how we protect the viscerals when we do thoracoabdominal aortic uh, surgery and how we protect uh, the brain. So the um, open thoracoabdominal operations, as most of you have actually um, encountered and have seen, uh, can be a very extensive operation and can carry significant uh, morbidity and uh, mortality. And the reason is because there is a distal aortic ischemia. And this distal aortic ischemia can manifest as complications of the kidneys as well as the uh, visceral vessels. And the viscerals like bowel and, um, uh, and of course, you know, the kidney and the, uh, the legs. Uh, the instance for a post-op uh, kidney injury can range from uh, 12 to up to 50% and up to 17% of the patients uh, will need uh, hemodialysis, which may decrease, as we know, the long-term survival. The mesenteric ischemia in these kind of cases is about like 3%, so it's not a lot. But what happens is, even though it's not a lot, the mortality can be up to uh, 60%. So let's see about the different adjuncts as well as uh, the main um, things that we use uh, for a thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm repair. The first thing that we use is the left heart bypass. Uh, that is the most common uh, way that we um, deal with the thoracoabdominal repairs. The second thing is a cardiopulmonary bypass with a hypothermic circulatory arrest. And then the adjuncts that we use, as I'm going to show you, is the cold renal perfusion, selective visceral perfusion. And then we're going to talk very briefly about how we manage surgically uh, the renal uh, and the visceral uh, arteries. So let's talk about the cardiopulmonary bypass. This is um, most of the centers, actually quite a few of them in the United States, they do use uh, cardiopulmonary bypass with a hypothermic uh, circulatory arrest. Now we don't use this quite often. The times that we use it is when we don't have um, a clamp site here and the aneurysm is very big where we have to actually use uh, cell arrest. Now, what is the easiest way uh, to establish uh, cell arrest? Is of course, as you very well known, is uh, via a femoral artery and femoral vein. Sometimes we can actually use the IVC uh, when we are open, but again, the whole idea here is to make things reproducible. So quite a few people can use the same technique. So the easier way actually to use it is via the left, uh, via the uh, common femoral vein and common femoral artery. And then after place the patient on cardiopulmonary bypass, um, we uh, drop the temperature down to 18 degrees or uh, 20 degrees. And in addition, we can use a drainage uh, via the uh, left inferior pulmonary vein 
uh, where we can relate uh, the uh, atrium. Uh, let's uh, go on into the left heart bypass. So the left heart bypass, what it is, this is a closed circuit. It's a temporary bypass that goes from the left atrium uh, into the descending thoracic ethmoid aorta. And the whole idea is to provide blood into the visceral kidneys and the distal ethmoid aorta. And what does the uh, left heart bypass does is that provides hysothermic self-oxygenated blood to the distal aorta. And uh, actually this is, uh, is being performed during the proximal anastomosis. And especially we use the left heart bypass for one, two, and sometimes uh, three um, type three repairs. And uh, we can see here is that uh, we have the inflow uh, cannula via the, um, uh, via the uh, left inferior pulmonary vein. And then the outflow um, <clears throat> uh, cannula into the descending, this is a descending uh, thoracic ethmoid aorta. Um, and this is um, the cold crystalloid circle. This is a completely different circuit, as you know. So now this is the left heart bypass circuit and the float said, uh, said to be uh, 1,500 to uh, 3,500 ml per uh, minute. So the left heart bypass is on during the proximal anastomosis, and this is what we call the protective ischemic time. We have found from uh, studies in the past that uh, left heart bypass can be protective uh, with the, uh, with the, uh, for the spinal cord. So, and this is uh, one of the reasons we actually, why we use it. Um, let's move into the cold renal perfusion. So the left heart bypass is completed after the proximal anastomosis is completed. At that point, the rest of the aorta is open and we proceed with the repair. Now, how we perfuse and how we, uh, how we um, actually, uh, what we do for the kidneys and the viscerals. With the kidneys, we use a cold cir uh, crist uh, crystalloid circuit. And this is a standalone roller hair pump circuit that goes direct into the left and the right uh, kidney, as you can see here with the French, uh, with the French, uh, with the nine French and the Pruy. Regarding the perfusates, uh, we can use, and we have shown this in multiple studies in the past, we can use blood, saline, rigorous lactate, uh, acetate, plasma light, or uh, uh, custodial. Now, as you know, for the last uh, approximately four years, maybe four year plus, we started using crystal or uh, custodial. Uh, before we use a rigorous lactate with uh, solumedrol as well as manitol. So in case that the custodial is not available, you can still use and have a great protection by using the uh, ringer lactate, um, uh, solmedrol and um, uh, manitol. Uh, how we do it, initially we give a bolus at 300 and then uh, we actually continue uh, to give another like two, 300 every 15 uh, to 20 minutes via these hemodic catheters. Regarding the visceral perfusion. Uh, so what we do with the visceral perfusion and the purpose is to actually mechanically perfuse the celiac axis as well as the superior mesenteric artery. And the whole idea is to minimize the hepatic ischemic time as well as mesenteric ischemic hemolytic time. Now, how we do that is that after the left heart bypass is off, we still have the circuit and we have a Y branch, as you can see here, and this Y branch is off the rerouted left heart bypass uh, circuit. And this, this Y branch, we have two nine French pruis that goes into the uh, left, uh, that goes into the superior mesenteric artery, as well as into the, um, as well as into the celiac, celiac and superior mesenteric ethmoid artery. And uh, we flow approximately four to 500 uh, ml per uh, minute. 
Uh, one of the uh, advantages of the visceral perfusion is the potential reduction in the risk of uh, post-operative coagulopathy and bacterial uh, translocation. And there's no really any apparent uh, addition or additional FMD risk of doing it. And it's relatively uh, easy to uh, perform. Now, how we uh, manage the renal and the visceral arteries. And this is a little beyond the scope of this talk, but just uh, very briefly, we can do an uh, endotherectomy bypass grafts, or we can use balloon expandable stents direct into the, um, into the vessels. Uh, how we um, do the um, uh, operation. In case that uh, we use uh, individual branch crafts, uh, we do the proximal anastomosis first, the distal anastomosis for perfuse the legs, and then we do this uh, individual anastomosis after we have perfused and we have established flow distally into the legs. Uh, in case that we do a patch anastomosis and we don't do the individual uh, grafts, then after we complete the proximal anastomosis during the left heart bypass, uh, then we proceed with the intercostal anastomosis, intercostal um, artery patch anastomosis, uh, then the visceral patch, and then final, you know, the legs. Uh, the most common configuration is actually the celiac SMA and the right renal together, where we do this anastomosis, then we, perf we perform the distal anastomosis, the legs, and then the final one is the left uh, renal where we do this uh, separate. So in summary, uh, the way that we protect the renal and the mesenteric uh, circulation during a thoracic abdominal or the aneurysm repair is with the left heart bypass or uh, with the cardiopulmonary bypass with a hypothermic circulatory arrest, uh, with a cold renal perfusion, visceral perfusion, and of course, then we decide regarding the surgical management and the expeditious uh, repair. Again, this kind of procedure is a team approach. It is not really uh, one person's uh, operation. As you can see, uh, your role into the entire, uh, during the entire procedure uh, is extremely important. Uh, let's switch gears now and let's see how we protect the brain uh, during a proximal arch uh, operation. So the primary goal here is to preserve the cerebral equity function. Uh, the brain tissue has a very high metabolic rate and is very sensitive uh, to ischemia. Uh, these are the main cerebral perfusion strategies. One is a deep hypothermia. The other one is the anti-grade cerebral perfusion. And then the other one is the retrograde cerebral perfusion. Of course, as most likely know, is that there is some um, debate about what is the optimum uh, brain protection strategy uh, during the heart surgery. Now, been here for the last 14 years, we haven't really used uh, retrograde cerebral uh, perfusion, uh, but still there is a few um, uh, parts in the country uh, where uh, retrograde cerebral perfusion has been used. Uh, Dr. Safi at, uh, and uh, Dr. Estrella at the University of Texas, uh, they do use retrograde uh, cerebral perfusion with excellent results. Uh, Dr. Giraldi uh, at, uh, in uh, Cornell in New York is also using retrograde cerebral perfusion uh, with excellent results uh, as well. And how about the deep hypothermia? Uh, this has been used uh, extensively from the Yale group and uh, the results that they have are actually uh, excellent, especially when uh, the circulatory arrest time is uh, uh, short. Uh, but we can see here is that when the circulatory arrest time uh, is beyond uh, the 50 minutes, you can see that the stroke actually uh, goes up to 16% uh, um, versus the 1.3 when the circulatory arrest time is actually short. Um, the ways that um, we think about it is that um, if we have to do any um, advance or any um, extensive arch uh, replacement and reconstruction. Um, we want to um, provide the brain with what we call like, the metabolites and certain like, other adjuncts in addition to the uh, hypothermia. 
you can see here, this is the uh, usual trends. Uh, that was in uh, was actually published from the uh, Yale Equity Group in 2014, uh, where you can see the trends uh, in Europe as well as in the United States. Uh, most of the people actually uh, they use as we can see 45% uh, anti-grade cerebral perfusion, uh, but there is still um, a lot of uh, centers where they use uh, deep hypothermia or they use the deep hypothermia in combination with the retrograde cerebral perfusion or in combination with uh, also anti-grade cerebral perfusion. And now, uh, what is our strategy? Uh, uh, the, regarding the cannulation strategy is uh, axillary or a nominal definite cannulation that we use as arterial inflow uh, for a cardiopulmonary hemorrhage bypass. And we have actually extensively published on that and how we think about how to cannulate. And this is when we have a primary repair, how we think if we're going to cannulate the anominate versus the axillary, or in case that we have a redo operation uh, where we have to think about the proximity of the uh, structures into the sternum. And of course, uh, which are the, uh, the cases where we proceed uh, with direct uh, aortic uh, cannulation. Uh, now, um, let's go through certain um, uh, simple steps. Um, after we are on, um, uh, on uh, circulatory and arrest, uh, we snare down. Uh, this is where we have actually cannulated the um, anominate. So at that point, when we snare down the tourniquet, uh, we give perfusion into the right side of the brain. And then we place a second cannula into the left common uh, carotid artery. Uh, if the question is, um, why do we need to have bilateral anti-grade cerebral perfusion is because we have found again with uh, other um, studies that we have done in the past uh, that um, because of the sick of wheelies that can be incomplete we have actually better results, especially when the ACP time is actually more uh, extensive. Now, by saying that, there is um, quite a, there is other groups in the United States, such as the Emory group, uh, where they have used the uh, unilateral cerebral perfusion with actually very good results, as well as some other groups in Germany. Regarding the temperature and management, uh, we like to uh, go around like 24 degrees and Celsius. Uh, we have actually multiple publications with regards to the temperature management. And uh, when we talk about moderate hypothermia, according to the consensus equity document quite a few years ago, moderate hypothermia is actually 20.1 uh, to 28 degrees. And for all the years, we have actually classified that um, with different studies that we have done in the low uh, moderate hypothermia or the high moderate hypothermia. Uh, but usually if it is something that is relatively simple, uh, we go down to uh, 24, 25 or sometimes 26 degrees. Uh, if it is something that we anticipate that is going to be a little more complicated, uh, we like to be close to 23 or 24 degrees. And actually some of these studies like this one here uh, or this one, you can actually recognize one of your uh, colleagues uh, name there, Athena Ramu, that she was actually um, very instrumental of uh, helping actually putting some of this uh, data together. Uh, so our preference is bilateral anti-grade cerebral perfusion uh, with uh, moderate hemolytic hypothermia. And then, of course, after the anastomosis is completed, uh, we go back to our full flow. So in summary, uh, we, the way that we prefer to do it, again, this is not necessarily the best way, uh, but it's just one way that worked for us throughout the years. And what, at least in my experience, have, I have seen here for the last 14 years, been participated in quite a few hundred, actually, of cases and with countless hours in the OR. Um, we perfuse the brain at the rate of 8 to 12 cc per minute per kilo, and we maintain a perfusion pressure at 50 to 60 um, millimeter mercury, 
And regarding the temperature, we keep it around to 23 uh, to 24 uh, degrees Celsius. Again, I would like to thank you for this opportunity. It's really, it's really a great privilege to be again here and talk to you. Um, um, every year, actually, I'm looking forward for this uh, invitation. And Deborah and Kathy, thank you so much for that. And uh, thank the entire organizing of the committee for uh, uh, putting this excellent program together. I would like Terry, I would like also to thank you again. And uh, the whole School of Perfusionists, uh, I consider most, I can see a lot of familiar faces around and I consider you my colleagues. Thank you for your support for the last uh, 14 years and it's really a privilege to be here.